Right, I, I know first of all that I have a major responsibility because I'm the last guy that's speaking before you have lunch. So I take that on board, but I really want to take you on a journey back to humanity. And when I start on that, I want to first of all engage you all. Now, there's some of you out there that I cannot see, but I'm going to trust you in this one. I'm going to ask you all two questions. So please raise your hand. The first question is, who believes in destiny? Pretty good. The second question is, who believes in luck? Okay, pretty much the same people. So for all of you out there who never raised your hand, I'm going to prove you wrong. Because when I was about two years old, I knew that I'd be standing here today. You don't believe me. I think my mother said to me, go and share your ideas with the world. I said, Mum, I'm not old enough yet, <laughs> but I will. But let's get back to reality, and reality was, for me, back in the year 2002, while working for DHL, <laughs> Po Chung, I'm the apprentice. <laughs> while working for DHL, I found myself living in Brussels in Belgium. Brussels is famous for a couple of things. It rains a lot, and it has the best chocolates in the world. And it was while I was living in, in Belgium that one very cold, wet afternoon, I was watching a TV documentary about one of the most famous, at that time, Belgium sports pe people. And that guy's name was Mark Hermans. And Mark was an Ironman triathlete. And this is one of these people that will do biking, running, and swimming until the cows come home. They never stop. And the Ironman endurance race is one of the longest and the toughest in the world. And back in, in 2001, Mark finished in sixth position in the Hawaii Ironman event, which is recognised as one of the toughest Ironman races in the world. That was pretty good. And as the documentary went on, it, it showed how Mark was going to change the world of triathlon because he was seen as the next best thing. This is a photo of Mark two months later. Mark had a bicycle accident and ended up paralysed from the waist down. Mark's life changed overnight. And as I sat in my living room that day and I poured my eyes out with tears, I decided that I wanted to reach out to help Mark. And it took me two days to track him down, because at DHL we have some very good tracking capability. <laughs> And I reached out and I contacted Mark and I said to Mark, what are you going to do with your life now? He said, simple, I'm going to go and do the Ironman triathlon again and I want to start a foundation to help children in wheelchairs. So the, two weeks later, Mark and I started, in our spare time, a foundation called To Walk Again. And Mark's biggest goal in life was simply that. He really believed that despite having two perforations in his spinal cord, he was going to get up out of that wheelchair and he was going to walk again. I was humbled. And every time I met Mark over the ensuing weeks, I went home crying. And it also started to change my life. And as I was working with Mark on our foundation, I realised that there was somebody else in the world who was just as ambitious to get out of their wheelchair and to walk again as well. So I decided to put some of my business powers to use and I created a lot of emails and I sent them across the Atlantic and I also set up a, a campaign, a marketing campaign, so that one day my friend, the Iron Man, could meet the ultimate man, the Superman. And it was late in 2002 that we got together with Superman Christopher Reeve in his house up in upstate New York. And that day was a day that changed my life for good. Because as I sat there and I listened to Chris talk about life and talking about the rewards of life, because every day is a reward in life that we all don't appreciate. I listened to this great man, and he wasn't just a great man for people who were in wheelchairs, he was a great human being for the planet. And I listened about how I could change my own life. And the memory that Chris gave me was this. If you have an idea, go and share it with the world. 
Because the more people you tell, they'll tell more people, and then it'll become a movement. So I guess Christopher Reeve and Ted had something in common. Yeah? Because they loved, both loved ideas. So let's fast forward a bit. It's 2007, and DHL's moved me to Singapore. And like Adam said before, Singapore, the Ritz, the glamour, it's appealing in some ways, but it's also destroying in other ways to a human being. So I decided, out of the wisdom of my own self, to have my first midlife crisis. <laughs> okay, pretty simple. At the age of 42, I decided to go and buy myself my very first motorcycle. <laughs> a killer machine that would go over 280 kilometers an hour and get me from one end of Singapore to the other in less than about 10 minutes, although you could never do that in Singapore. And then I decided to ride my motorcycle from Singapore to Cambodia and back for Christmas, a trek of 5,500 kilometers. And it was during that journey that I stopped off at a school in Cambodia where I decided to start up my own foundation to help 1,000 children at a primary school in the middle of Cambodia. I had learned a little bit about running a foundation, but I knew nothing about sustainability of an NGO operation in a country like Cambodia. I was a novice and I knew it. I took on one of the biggest challenges of my life. But through that, I came across this. This is probably the most scariest number you're ever going to remember. Because 24,455 represents the number of days that you're expected to live. Now, I don't know whether you've ever had your life expectancy spelled out to you before in the number of days. But when I first heard this, it really changed my outlook on life. For one, I'm over halfway. Scary. What was I achieving? I had a great career at DHL. I had traveled the world. In fact, I had been to over 140 countries around the world working on different projects for DHL. Po Chung, the apprenticeship really works. But that wasn't enough. So I decided that I wanted to come up with an idea and I wanted to come up with an idea that would change the world. After all, I worked for a company that allowed me to be an entrepreneur and to explore the boundaries of my own creativity. So I definitely went out there with a the thought process of saying, I'm going to change the world by changing all of your social conscious thinking. I'm going to transform you into people who want to do more to make the world a better place. And the way that I'm going to do that is with the organization that I'm in the process of commencing today. And that's called the Humanity Group. And it's a very simple concept because we have individuals, we have companies, we have students, and we have NGOs. And there's a big bridge that's required between all of those different perspectives. And what we're going to do at the Humanity Group is we're going to cross those bridges. And the first one we've done is we've created Humanity Magazine. Great time to go into the publishing game. Every, every magazine we know is going into the toilet. But we started off by printing a magazine in 2009, and we distributed it to 30 countries around the world. In January next year, we'll launch Humanity Television, and Humanity Television will inspire, educate, and motivate people on how they too can give back, and how they can make the world a better place. I'm a firm believer that there's millions of people in this world who want to make the world a better place, they simply don't know how to go about and do it. The Humanity Group is going to be an enabler for people to be able to go and make a difference. Not only are there people like you in this room, there's millions of people out there with all the different skill sets that can help us build green schools, who can help us make sustainable environments. And we're going to help people do that. So we're going to take people, John, we're going to come and visit your green school and have lunch with you. And humanity travel is just not philanthropy travel. It's about actually going to the developing world and seeing how smarter those people are than us. And learning about what the opportunities are in the developing world for us to make the whole world a better place. I hate the acronym Corporate Social Responsibility, CSR. I prefer... CSI, because I think every company in the world should be corporate social innovators. And I firmly believe that by doing that, then every employee that works for any company, whether they be a multinational, 
a medium size or a small company, has an ability to be able to give back through their business. So not everybody has to give up their day jobs and take motorbike trips to change their life. They can do it by a course of action through the business that they're actually working for. So we're actually helping companies do that. We're helping companies see beyond corporate social responsibility. And then there's a lot of amazing people that we already know about in this world who are making the world a better place and they need to be recognised more. We need to listen to talk and have conversations with these heroes. So next year in Singapore, we're having the first Asia Pacific Humanity Awards that are going to recognise lots of different groups of people for the outstanding work that they're doing in the social space. And then a close one to my heart is all about sports. There's millions of people around the world that every weekend they go out, they play their golf, their tennis, they go swimming, they go mountaineering, but they can do something more with a purpose. So we're creating a virtual global team of sports people who are going to raise money, create awareness, and give back to charities of their choice. So it's not just going to be those one-off marathon runners or those one-off people that do a particular event. It's going to be all of us that can use our sports as a way of making the world a better place. So what happened with our magazine? Well, in 2009, when we launched our first issue, we went to 30 countries around the world. Two months ago, the Humanity magazine is being read in over 103 countries around the world. The Humanity magazine is being read by business leaders, by politicians, it's on airlines, it's in hotels, and all we're doing is we're spreading the good news about how inspirational people are doing something to make the world a better place. And we encourage you all to be contributors to this, because you're all doing something, or you can, to make the world a better place. And then it was, the, it was time for the next idea. So what did I do? I had my second midlife crisis. Now, I think this is pretty cool, having a midlife crisis every few years, because it keeps reinventing you, right? And I don't see midlife crisis necessarily as being a bad thing. So my next midlife crisis was to say, hey, Mark, if you're really passionate and you're really committed about this, it's time to leave the corporate world and really put your heart and soul into it. So on July the 9th this year, after 22 years, three months, and six days, I walked out of DHL for the last time, and I never looked back. So what I can say to you is this, as you've already heard from some of the other speakers this morning, life truly begins at the end of your comfort zone. And I'm no smarter and I'm no braver than anybody in the audience today. But I stepped outside of my comfort zone on a number of occasions now, and it's the best thing I've ever done in my life. So I'm going to leave you this last slide. And before I say what I'm going to say, I'm just going to say that I'm not bad at spelling. <laughs> I'm not that bad at spelling. But I want you to sit there and think about this and ask yourself this question. What can I do to give back to humanity. Thank you.